The Theology of the Shepherd of Hermas. The book is entitled The Shepherd of Hermas because an angel appeared to Hermas dressed like a shepherd to command him to write an inspired book to deliver to God's church. The contents of The Shepherd of Hermas affirms that Hermas was a prophet who ministered in the city of Rome from about 60 to 90 AD. Therefore, if we are to believe the contents of the Shepherd of Hermas, the book itself was intended to be a part of the body of New Testament inspired scripture. The Apostle Paul knew both Hermas and Clement of Rome, as Hermas is listed in Romans 16 14 and Clement in Philippians 4 3. In Hermas Vision 2 4, Hermas lists Clement as a contemporary leader of the church in Rome who sent copies of the Shepherd of Hermas throughout the known world. Since the historical data proves that Clement was a leader in the church in Rome at the same time as Hermas, and since the Apostle Paul personally knew both Clement and Hermas within the first century, it is clear that Hermas wrote the Shepherd during the first century while some of the apostles were still alive. Many scholars have pointed out that the Muratorian fragment says that Hermas wrote the Shepherd during the lifetime of Bishop Pius in the mid-second century. Bishop Pius was a Roman bishop of the city of Rome in the mid-second century. However, Scholars George Edmondson and John Robinson have conclusively shown that the Muratorian fragment is full of errors and that Hermas Vision 3.5 clearly states that some of these apostles were still alive while the shepherd was written. Therefore, the shepherd of Hermas had to have been written within the first century while some of the apostles were still living. George Edmondson wrote in his book, The Church in Rome in the First Century, page 215, and I quote, It has already been suggested that the Muratorian fragmentists blundered in his assertion that the work of Hermas was written during the episcopate of his brother Pope Pius I, because he confused the author of the pastor shepherd means the pastor, with a well-known brother of the bishop who actually bore that name. George Edmondson continued, It is certainly very strange that if Hermas wrote his book during his brother's episcopate, there should not be a single reference to that brother's existence in a work in which the author several times speaks of his family and as has been said, repeatedly deals with the condition, organization, and affairs of the church in Rome. George Edmondson further pointed out that Hermas himself opened the shepherd by writing that he was sold into Rome as a slave and that Hermas happens to be a Greek name while the Roman bishop Pius is a Roman name. Therefore, it is very unlikely that a Greek slave who was sold into Rome with a Greek name, Hermas, could have been the brother of Pius who had a Roman name. Scholars have further pointed out that many of the earliest Christian writers revered and cited the shepherd of Hermas as inspired scripture. It seems very unlikely that 2nd and 3rd century Christian writers such as Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen would have cited Hermas if it was not written within the first century. The shepherd of Hermas almost made its way into the New Testament but was rejected because its theology is clearly non-Trinitarian. Even Roman Catholic scholars admit that the shepherd of Hermas had great authority in ancient times and was ranked with Holy Scripture. And I quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia, published in 1910. The shepherd, pastor, a work which had great authority in ancient times and was ranked with Holy Scripture. 
Eusebius tells us that it was publicly read in the churches and that while some denied it to be canonical, others considered it most necessary. St. Athanasius speaks of it, St. Irenaeus and Tertullian in his Catholic days cite the shepherd as scripture. Clement of Alexandria constantly quotes it with reverence, and so does Origen." End quote. The preponderance of Trinitarian scholars have tried to claim that the Shepherd of Hermas was written in the second century because they do not want to admit that the earliest first century Roman church that the apostles themselves founded baptized in Jesus' name and believed that the Spirit of the Son of God is the Holy Spirit. Since the Shepherd of Hermas was quoted as inspired scripture by many of the earliest Christian writers, including Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Origen, the Shepherd of Hermas must have originated during the first century AD. For why would the second and third century Christians accept it as scripture if it was not written during the first century? The Shepherd of Hermas was bound with the New Testament in the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Claromontanus, but was rejected by the later Roman Catholic Church. Trinitarian translator Jack N. Sparks wrote in his preface to his translation of the Shepherd of Hermas, You wouldn't call Hermas a precise theologian. His terminology in speaking of the Son and the Holy Spirit is so confusing that he seems to identify the two as the same person. That sounds like modalism. Hermas wrote concerning the deity of Jesus in parable 5-6, the pre-existent Holy Spirit which created all things did God make to dwell in a body of flesh chosen by himself. If Hermas and the first century Roman church believed in a trinity, Hermas parable 5, 6 should have stated that the pre-existent Son did God make to dwell in a body of flesh, or a pre-existent God the Son did God make to dwell in a body of flesh. Yet Hermas declared that the Holy Spirit of God incarnated himself in a body of flesh chosen by himself. Hermas clearly believed that the deity of Jesus is the Holy Spirit in parable 9.1. And I quote, The angel of repentance, he came to me and said, I want to show you what the Holy Spirit, which spoke with you in the form of the church, showed you. For that spirit is the Son of God. Hermas plainly wrote that the Holy Spirit is that spirit, which is the Son of God. Since the annals of church history prove that the shepherd or angel of Hermas, was widely received and accepted by the earliest Roman Christians, it is clear that these Roman Christians also believed that the Holy Spirit of God is the Spirit that became the Son of God by incarnating himself as baby Jesus. Hence, the earliest Christians, who lived while some of the apostles were still alive, believed that Jesus is the Holy Spirit of God incarnated in a body rather than an alleged second divine person called God the Son. Since the apostles themselves founded the first century Roman church, it is hard to believe that the theology of the first century Roman church differed from the theology of the original apostles in the first century. The teachings of the shepherd of Hermas are identical with the Bible. Luke 135 states, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. So here we find the Holy Spirit is the Spirit who incarnated himself to become baby Jesus. And that's why baby Jesus is called the Son of God, because of his virgin conception and birth. Luke 135 proves that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary to supernaturally conceive baby Jesus. But if the Trinity were true, then it should read that an eternal divine person called God the Son came over Mary to sire the Christ child. Therefore, 
the theology of the earliest Roman Christian church is identical with the Bible's teaching. Trinitarians hate to admit that Hermas taught oneness theology and water baptism in Jesus' name in Rome while some of the apostles were still alive. Like modern-day oneness Pentecostals, the early first century Roman church believed that water baptism into the name of the Son of God alone is necessary for salvation. Hermas Book 2, Command 4-3 says, Hermas asked the angel, I have heard, sir, say I, from certain teachers, that there is no other repentance than that which took place when we went down into the water, immersion, and received remission of our former sins. He said to me, You have well heard, for so it is. For he who has received remission of his sins ought not to sin any more, but to live in purity. Here we find evidence proving that the first century Roman church taught that water baptism is for receiving the remission of our former sins. Hermas Parable 9.12 says, Did you see the stones which were entered through the portico or doorway were placed into the structure of the tower, symbolic of the church, but the ones that did not so enter were returned to their own place? No one will enter the kingdom of God unless he takes his holy name. For if you want to enter a city, and that particular city has been walled around and has one entrance, could you possibly enter that city except by the gateway? So, a man cannot enter the kingdom of God other than by the name of the Son of God. Notice, the text says, no one will enter the kingdom of God unless he takes his holy name, and then it says, a man cannot enter the kingdom of God other than by the name of the Son of God. Sounds like John 3, 5. Unless a man is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The portico, or the doorway, is Jesus the Son of God. This is the only entrance to the Lord. Whoever does not receive his name, the name of the Son of God, cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The contest is speaking about water baptism. It is in the context of water baptism, parable 9.13 goes on to state, these all, he said, receive the name of God. Hence, we can clearly see that the Son's name is the name of God, the name of God the Father. John 17.11, Jesus prayed, Holy Father, keep them through your name, the name which you have given me. Your name is the name of the Father. Parable 9.14 goes on to say, The name of the Son of God is great and cannot be contained and supports the whole world. Hermas Vision 4.2 says, You can be saved by no other than by his great and glorious name. Notice it says name in the singular, not in the plural. There's only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12. In the context of water baptism, parable 9.16 further explains the necessity of water baptism into the name of the Son of God. And I quote parable 9.16. It was necessary, he answered the angel, to ascend through water in order that they might be made alive. For unless they laid aside the deadness of their life, they could not in any other way enter into the kingdom of God. Accordingly, those also who fell asleep received the seal of the Son of God. For he continued, Before a man bears the name of the Son of God, he is dead. But when he receives the seal, he lays aside the deadness and obtains life. The seal then is the water. Water baptism into the name of the Son of God. They descend into the water. Baptism by immersion, going down into the water. They descend into the water dead, and they arise alive. And to them, accordingly, was this seal preached, and they made use of it that they might enter into the kingdom of God. Sounds like John 3, 5. Unless a man is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
1 Peter 3, 20 and 21 says that eight souls were saved in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Eight souls were saved by water. The like figure went to even baptism does also now save us. The shepherd or the angel of Hermas clearly teaches that no one can enter into the kingdom of God unless he or she receives the name of the Son of God in water baptism as a seal. Here we have plain evidence proving that the early Christian church in Rome believed that water baptism must be conducted into the name of the Son of God by immersion, the name of Jesus Christ. This is exactly what modern apostolic faith Christians believe, even though they are condemned as heretics for doing so. In the Shepherd of Hermas Vision 3.3, we read that Hermas asks, Why was the tower, symbolic of the church, built upon the water, O Lady? The Lady here is the Bride of Christ called the Church. This was a vision of a woman which represented God's elect, the Church, and also the Spirit of the Son of God was speaking through the woman. So we know Jesus, the Spirit of the Son of God, was speaking to Hermas when Hermas asked, Why was the tower, which is symbolic of the church, built upon the water, O lady? She answered, I told you before, and you still inquire carefully. Therefore, inquiring you shall find the truth. Hear then why the tower is built upon the water. It is because your life has been and will be saved through water. For the tower was founded on the word of the almighty and glorious name, and it is kept together by the invisible power of the Lord. Notice, your life has been and will be saved through water. The church is built upon the water. Vision 3, chapter 7 goes on to state, Do you wish to know who are the others that fell near the water but could not be rolled into the water? These are they who have heard the word and wish to be baptized in the name of the Lord. But when the chastity demanded by the truth comes into their recollection, they draw back and again walk after their own wicked desires. The teaching of Hermas was accepted by the majority of believers in the first and second centuries is in harmony with the commands of our current canon of New Testament scripture. New believers are commanded to repent and be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. Acts 2.38 Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 22.16 Ananias said to Saul of Tarsus at his conversion And now why are you delaying? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. Since the shepherd of Hermas was received by the first century Roman church and the majority of churches throughout the Roman Empire, the majority of the earliest Christians in the first century must have embraced oneness theology and the essentiality of water baptism into the name of the Son of God to be born of the water for the remission of sins. The early church clearly taught the oneness of God. Hermas Book 2, Commandment 1 says, First of all, believe that there is one God who created and finished all things and made all things out of nothing. He alone is able to contain the whole, but himself cannot be contained. The angel commanded Hermas to believe in only one God who created and finished all things as a single he, who alone is able to contain the whole but himself cannot be contained. This is another way of saying that there is only one omnipresent God who fills heaven and earth. The context of many passages within the Shepherd of Hermas affirms that the Son of God is the Holy Spirit who fills all things. That makes Jesus the Spirit of the only true God who incarnated himself to become a true man for our salvation. Hermas Vision 3.9 states that the Holy Spirit, who is that Spirit called the Son of God, spoke to Hermas saying, Instruct each other therefore and be at peace among yourselves, 
that I also, standing joyfully before your Father, may give an account of you all to your Lord. The above text proves that the old woman, which symbolized the church, was speaking to Hermas in the above passage. Similitude 9.1 says, I wish to explain to you what the Holy Spirit that spoke with you in the form of the church showed you, for that Spirit is the Son of God. So we know that it was the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Son of God, who was speaking in Hermas Vision 3.9, who said, that I also, standing joyfully before your Father, may give an account of you, all to your Lord or to the Father. Therefore, the Holy Spirit who overshadowed the Virgin in Luke 135 is that Spirit who became the Son of God in the Incarnation. Wherefore, according to the first century Roman Church, Jesus is the Holy Spirit who gives an account to God as our mediator, our advocate, and intercessor to God the Father. That's the meaning of the Greek word paraclete in John 14, 26, calls the Holy Spirit the paraclete, which means advocate and intercessor. And then John 14, 16 through 18, calls Jesus the paraclete who advocates and intercedes for us. When he said, I will not leave his orphans, I will come to you as the indwelling spirit. Likewise, 1 John 2, 1 calls Jesus the paraclete. We have an advocate with the Father, which is paraclete. Jesus Christ the righteous. So we find in Scripture that the Holy Spirit is spoken of as our paraclete. For example, John 14, 26. And we find Jesus is spoken of as our paraclete. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus, the Son of God, who advocates and intercedes to God for us. Because a non-incarnate God, the Holy Spirit person, cannot advocate to God without becoming a lesser God, not a co-equal God person. So we know that the Holy Spirit is that God who became a man. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the only true God, the Father, who descended upon the Virgin in the Incarnation to become the man Christ Jesus. That's why it says the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Son of God. Hermas Book 2, Commandment 10, 2 states that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God Himself. Grieve not the Holy Spirit which dwells in you, lest He entreat God against you and he withdraw from you. For the Spirit of God, which has been granted to us to dwell in the body, does not endure grief. Notice that the Holy Spirit can entreat God while still being called the Spirit of God. It is impossible for an alleged non-incarnate co-equal God the Holy Spirit as a third co-equal God person to entreat God while being co-equal with him. Also notice that the text says the Spirit of God, which means that the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of the only true God who is our Heavenly Father. Here we can clearly see that the Holy Spirit of God the Father also became the Son in the Incarnation. This explains why the Holy Spirit is the indwelling Spirit of Christ throughout New Testament Scripture. For example, Romans 8, 9 says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 9 calls the Spirit of God the Spirit of Christ, because God became a man in the Incarnation through his own Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the only true God, the Father. Furthermore, the context of Parable 9 addresses baptism in the name of the Son of God. But Parable 9.13 goes on to say, These all, he said, receive the name of God. Hence, we can clearly see that the Son's name is the name of God. Isaiah 64.8, Exodus 3.14.15, and Zechariah 14.9 proves that God has only one name, and that name was given to Jesus, which means Yahweh saves. Hence, Yahshua, Hebrew for Jesus, is the name of Yahweh, our Savior. Hermas Book 2, Commandment 5.1 says, Be patient, said he, and of good understanding, and you will rule over every wicked work, and you will work all righteousness. For if you be patient, 
The Holy Spirit that dwells in you will be pure. He will not be darkened by an evil spirit, but dwelling in a broad region, he will rejoice and be glad. And with the vessel in which he dwells, he will serve God in gladness, having great peace within himself. Notice, he will serve God in gladness. Could a co-equal God, the Holy Spirit person, serve God with gladness? Notice the text says, the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, he will serve God with gladness. How can an alleged non-incarnate God, the Holy Spirit person, be said to serve God with gladness while remaining co-equal with God the Father? Similitude 9 states that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Son of God. Hence, the only viable way to make sense of this passage is if the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Son of God as the Spirit of the risen Christ, the Spirit of the human Jesus, God who became man, who serves God as the indwelling Spirit of truth. Ephesians 4.10 says that he ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. God as God has always filled all things, but when God became a man, the man Christ Jesus did not fill all things until God took the human spirit of the risen Christ, sent him far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. The same is true with 1 Corinthians 15.45, that the spirit of the risen Christ became a life-giving spirit. Galatians 4, 6 says, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Hermas book 2, commandment 5, 1 goes on to say, But if any outburst of anger take place, forthwith the Holy Spirit, who is tender, is straightened, not having a pure place, and he, the Holy Spirit, seeks to depart. For he, the Holy Spirit, is choked by the vile spirit and cannot attend on the Lord as he wishes. Notice, the Holy Spirit attends unto the Lord, on the Lord as the Lord wishes. Again, how could an alleged non-incarnate co-equal God, the Holy Spirit person, be said to attend on the Lord, the only true God, the Father, as he wishes while remaining co-equal with the Lord? The shepherd of Hermas, parable 5, 6 says, You see, he said, that he is the Lord of the people, having received all authority from his Father. We know the man, Christ Jesus, received all authority from his Father. And why the Lord took his Son as counselor and the glorious angels regarding the airship of the slave. Listen. The pre-existent Holy Spirit which created all things did God make to dwell in a body of flesh chosen by himself. For this conduct of the flesh pleased him because it was not defiled on the earth while having the Holy Spirit. He took therefore as fellow counselors his son and the glorious angels. How is it possible that the Lord took his son as a counselor if the son was always a co-equal counselor as a God the son throughout eternity past to begin with? Likewise, it is impossible for the Son of God to serve as the Father's counselor while being truly co-equal with him. For God as God does not serve anyone. Therefore, the first century Roman church clearly taught that the human Son of God was taken as the Father's counselor only after the Son's resurrection and ascension into heaven, which is in line with Ephesians 4.10 Rather than an alleged pre-existent Son creating all things, the text states the pre-existent Holy Spirit which created all things, God made to dwell in a body of flesh chosen by himself. We know that the scriptures teach that there is only one Heavenly Father who created all things alone and by himself. Since the scriptures repeatedly state that the Father created everything by his own anthropomorphic hands, we know that the Holy Spirit of God must be the Holy Spirit of the only true God, the Father, who later incarnated himself in a body of flesh chosen by himself. Isaiah 64, 8 says, You are our Father, we are the clay, you are our potter, and we are all the work of your hands. 
We are all the work of the Father's hands. You are our Father. According to Hermas, our Heavenly Father took the Son as his counselor along with the glorious angels because the Son's flesh pleased the Father by not being defiled on the earth as a man. If the Father took the Son as his counselor after dwelling on the earth as a man in the flesh, then it makes no sense that the Son pre-existed as a literal counselor with the Father before the Son's birth on the earth. Furthermore, the above passage says the pre-existent Holy Spirit which created all things did God make to dwell in a body of flesh chosen by himself. Here we find that the Son was not literally a Son until the Holy Spirit incarnated himself to dwell in the flesh of the man Christ Jesus. For the text does not say the pre-existent Son, it says the pre-existent Holy Spirit. Therefore, the early Roman church never believed in the later timeless eternal Son view that was first taught with origin in the mid-third century. The Shepherd of Hermas, Parable 9.1 says, After I had written down the commandments and similitudes of the shepherd, the angel of repentance, he came to me and said, I wish to explain to you what the Holy Spirit that spoke with you in the form of the church showed you, for that Spirit is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is the Son of God. Trinitarian theology teaches that the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son. Yet the first century Roman church taught that the Holy Spirit is the Son of God. The only theological view compatible to the first century Roman teaching is oneness modalism. For all three remaining views, Trinitarianism, Arianism, and Socinianism, do not affirm that the Holy Spirit is the Son of God. Thus we can see that the first century Roman church could not have been Trinitarian, Arian, like Jehovah's Witnesses, or Socinian, believing that Jesus is just a man and not God. For Trinitarian theology believes that the Son is not the Holy Spirit, while Arian theology believes that the Son is an angelic creation who could not be the indwelling Holy Spirit, while Socinian theology believes that the Son is just a special man who could not be the Holy Spirit. Therefore, all theological views, except oneness modalism, teach that the Holy Spirit is not the same person as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Oneness Pentecostals believe that the Holy Spirit is the same person called Jesus, the Son of God, via incarnation through the Virgin, yet Trinitarianism, Arianism and Socinianism denies that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Wherefore, the only remaining theological view left that fits with the contents of the Shepherd of Hermas is modalistic monarchianism, or oneness Pentecostal theology, which was still the most prominent view held by the early Christians in the early to mid third century. Trinitarians and Arians often cite Hermas Parable 9.12 in their attempt to show that Jesus as a son literally pre-existed his birth as a son rather than as the Holy Spirit of God. Since Hermas repeatedly affirmed that the pre-existent Holy Spirit became the Son of God in the Incarnation, we know that Hermas could not have believed that the Son literally pre-existed as a son before being given that title as his birth. He was first called the Son in Luke 135 because he's called the Son because of his virgin conception in the Virgin Mary. Hermas Parable 9.12 says, This rock, he answered, and this gate are the Son of God. How, sir, I said, the rock is old and the gate is new. Listen, he said, and understand, O ignorant man. The Son of God is older than all his creatures. Notice, older than all his creatures. So that he was a fellow counselor with the Father in his work of creation. For this reason he is old. And why is the gate new, sir? I said. Because he answered, he became manifested in the last days of the dispensation. For this reason the gate was made new. That they who are to be saved by it might enter into the kingdom of God. 
Just as the shepherd of Hermas speaks of the church as an old woman who was created first of all, so the Son of God is already spoken of as being older than all his creation. And here is the passage again, vision 2-4. It is the church. And I said to him, why then is she an old woman? Because she, the old woman, was created first of all. On this account she is old, and for her sake was the world made. In order to find the proper meaning of the parables, visions, and similitudes in the shepherd of Hermas, we must understand that Hermas often spoke allegorically rather than literally. We know that Hermas saw a vision of an old woman which clearly represented God's church as the whole bride of Christ rather than a literal woman as a single individual. The shepherd of Hermas also speaks of the old woman as the spirit of the Son of God which spoke to the old woman. The beginning of Similitude 9 first states that the Holy Spirit is the Son of God. Then in Similitude 9, 12, we find that the Son of God is older than all his creatures, so that he was a fellow counsel with the Father in his work of creation. Notice that the text says that the Son of God is older than all his creatures. Why would the Son of God be included in the same sentence as being older than all his creatures, his creation? if the Son of God was not also a part of the Father's creation. The words older than implies that the Son is older than all the rest of God's creation in the sense of the Son being the beginning of the creation of God, just like it says in Revelation 3.14. Jesus said he's the beginning of the creation of God. That means that the Son is included in the creation. Thus, there is a definitive connection between the Son of God and all the rest of God the Father's creation. Also notice that Parable 5-6 and Similitude 9-1 state that the Holy Spirit is that Spirit which later became the Son of God. Again, the pre-existent Holy Spirit which created all things did God make to dwell in a body of flesh chosen by himself. It doesn't say the pre-existent Son of God, it says the pre-existent Holy Spirit. Parable 5-6 is obviously talking about the pre-existent Holy Spirit being the Spirit who incarnated himself in the body of Jesus Christ to be called the Son of God. Similitude 9-1 says, The Holy Spirit that spoke with you in the form of the church, in the form of the old woman, showed you. For that Spirit is the Son of God. So we find that the old woman, which spoke in the form of the church, was actually the Spirit of the Son of God, which also represented God's elect, God's church as a whole. So since the woman, the church, is spoken of as both the church and Jesus, the Son of God, we know that the Son of God was created first of all. Before anything else, Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God, Revelation 3.14. It is hard to imagine that the Holy Spirit who created all things could be a part of the creation itself. But it makes sense to believe that the Son of God is older than all of the Father's creation in the sense of being the beginning of the creation of God and the firstborn of all creation in Colossians 1.15 in the Father's prophetic express thought before the creation actually took place. The Son of God is older than all his creatures because he was first born or first created in God's prophetic mind and plan before the literal creation actually took place. God the Father used his own word, his own express thought or plan, as the counsel of his own will, according to Ephesians 1.11, in Christ, to create all things in his own mind and heart before God actually created all things physically. Just like a man who builds a building first creates a detailed blueprint before he actually creates the building, so God first pre-created all things in his own mind, heart, and plan before he actually performed the creation. Theophilus of Antioch, who ministered between 169 and 183 AD within the 2nd century, 
who first used the word triad in the East, wrote in his Apology to Autolycus, Book 2, 22, As truth expounds, the word that always exists, residing within the heart of God. Notice, the word residing within the heart of God, for before anything came into being, he had him, the word, as a counselor, being his own mind and thought. But when God wished to make all that he determined on, he begot his word, uttered the firstborn of all creation. Notice, the word, which is the express thought of God, which is the Son was foreknown before the creation of the world, in God's express thought, his logos, resided within the heart of God, for before anything came into being, he had him, the Son, as a counselor, being his own mind and thought. Notice that Theophilus in the second century taught that God had the Son as his own mind and thought before he was actually begotten. Then Theophilus says in the next sentence, but when God wished to make all that he determined on, he then begot his word, uttered the firstborn of all creation. Even the semi-Aryan founding father of the Catholic Church believed that it was possible for the father to have his son as a counselor within his own mind and thought before the son actually came into existence as a son. Hence, in the mid to late 2nd century, Theophilus taught that the father already had him, his son, as a counselor, being his own mind and thought, the Father's own mind and thought, before actually being begotten. However, like Arius, Theophilus taught that the Son was actually begotten in heaven before his birth in Bethlehem to create all that he determined. Theophilus taught that the Son was begotten twice, begotten in heaven and then begotten on earth again, on the earth as a man. Hence, Theophilus taught Arian rather than Trinitarian theology. For Trinitarian theology teaches that the Son always actually existed with no beginning, while modalism teaches that the Son was the Father's own counsel as his own mind and thought before being begotten as a human child born and son given. Proverbs 8, 22-31 states that God first made wisdom. James Pate of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion wrote, What was God like before he made wisdom? Was he unwise? Or maybe Proverbs is saying that wisdom was an emanation from God, who already is wise. The rabbis in Genesis Rabbah treat wisdom as God's plan for the universe. When an architect designs a house, he draws up a plan. And that's what wisdom was for God. God was already wise when he drew up the plan, but the plan, the wisdom, was a concrete expression of God's intended order for the universe. The rabbis equated wisdom as God's blueprint for the universe. Wherefore, Early Judaism affirms that the word and wisdom of God was never a distinct God person, distinct from God the Father. One as Pentecostals also affirm that God's word and God's wisdom are the emanations from God the Father's own mouth, rather than a distinct co-equal divine person beside him. For Yahweh gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding, Proverbs 2, 6. Can a co-equal God person have come forth or emanated from the anthropomorphic mouth of the only true God the Father while still being co-equal with him? Certainly not. Wherefore, Hermas addressed the Son in a prophetic anticipatory sense just as he addressed God's elect as a woman who was created first in God's mind and plan before the world was actually created. Therefore, the angel who spoke to Hermas addressed the word and wisdom of God as the foreknown son, just as wisdom was already personified in Proverbs 8, 22-30, without actually existing yet as the human child born and son that would be given. 
Hermas Vision 2 states that the old woman would symbolize God's elect church and the Son of God was created first of all. On this account she is old, and for her sake the world was made. In the same way the rock is old because the Son was the beginning of the creation of God and the firstborn of all creation before actually existing as a Son of God. God clearly created all things first like a heavenly blueprint before he actually created all things in the physical realm. Since God's elect church was not literally created first of all, we know that the Son of God was not literally created either. Hence, the foreknown Son, although not yet born, served as a fellow counselor with the Father in his work of creation in God's prophetic mind and plan. If this is not the case, why then does parable 5-6 state that the pre-existent Holy Spirit which created all things did God make to dwell in a body of flesh chosen by himself? If the Son was a literal counselor before his birth, why does parable 5-6 say the pre-existent Holy Spirit became incarnate as the Son? The pre-existent Holy Spirit which created all things did God make to dwell in a body of flesh chosen by himself? So Jesus did not pre-exist as a son. He pre-existed as the Holy Spirit before becoming a son. The son was foreknown, according to 1 Peter 1.20, in the mind and plan of God, but did not literally become the child born and son given until he was born of the virgin. Parable 5.6 is obviously talking about the pre-existent Holy Spirit being the spirit who incarnated himself in the body of Jesus Christ. Similitude 9 1, the Holy Spirit that spoke with you in the form of the church showed you, for that Spirit is the Son of God. There are only two plausible explanations for these texts. Number one, the Holy Spirit literally counseled the Father as a lesser God person who created all things, which is a violation of Isaiah 44 24, Isaiah 64 8, and Hebrews 2 7, and Psalm 2 7. Because these texts prove that the Father alone created all things by his own hands, which makes the Holy Spirit the Spirit of the Father who incarnated himself as the Christ child. Number two, God used the counsel of his own will, which was already foreknown in Christ in his expressed thought, to create all things before the Son literally existed as a man on the earth. Because the title Son means a man, a human offspring. In Similitude 9.1, Hermas identified the woman who spoke in the form of the church as the Spirit of the Son of God. I wish to explain to you what the Holy Spirit that spoke with you in the form of the church showed you, for that Spirit is the Son of God. Since the woman is symbolic of both the church and the Son of God, Similitude 9.1, Similitude 9.12 proves that the Son of God could not have literally existed as a son because the woman spoken of in similitude 9.12 was created first of all. Hermes Vision 2 also explains that the woman which is symbolic of both the church and the Son of God was created first of all. Who do you think that the old woman is from whom you received the book? And I said the Sibyl, which means a prophetess. You are in a mistake, says he. It is not the prophetess. Who is it then, say I? And he said, it is the church. And I said to him, why then is she an old woman? Because, said he, she was created first of all, on this account she is old, and for her sake was the world made. The shepherd of Hermas speaks of the church as an old woman who was created first, so the Son of God is already spoken of as being older than all his creation. In Similitude 5.6 we read, For this conduct of the flesh pleased him, because it was not defiled on the earth while having the Holy Spirit. He took, therefore, as fellow counselors his Son and the glorious angels. Similitude 5.6 proves that the Son was actually taken by God to become his counselor after the Incarnation and not before it. Therefore, the Son could not have actually been a counselor before his birth at Bethlehem. Since Hermas wrote that the Holy Spirit is the Son of God, Trinitarians must admit that this passage either speaks of a binitarian Godhead of only the Father and the Holy Spirit as two divine persons, or something else is meant for Jesus being called a fellow counselor with the Father in his work of creation. 
Similitude 5, 6 says, He himself purged away their sins, having suffered many trials and undergone many labors, for no one is able to dig without labor and toil. He himself then, having purged away the sins of the people, showed them the paths of life by giving them the law which he received from his Father. You see, he said, that he is the Lord of the people, having received all authority from his Father, and why the Lord took his Son as counselor. In other words, the Son was not always a counselor, but the Lord took his Son as counselor, and the glorious angels, regarding the heirship of the slave, listen, the holy pre-existent spirit that created every creature, God made to dwell in flesh which he chose. This flesh, accordingly, in which the Holy Spirit dwelt, was nobly subject to that spirit, walking religiously and chastely, in no respect of following spirit, and accordingly, after living excellently and purely, speaking of living excellently and purely on planet Earth, and after laboring and cooperating with the spirit, and having in everything acted vigorously and courageously along with the spirit, the Holy Spirit, he assumed it as a partner with it. He's talking about the flesh. For this conduct of the flesh pleased him because it was not defiled on the earth while having the Holy Spirit. He took, therefore, as fellow counselors his Son and the glorious angels. Similitude 5 6 states that God the Father did not actually take his Son as his counselor until after Christ purged away our sins, which clearly occurred after the incarnation. Yet similitude 9.12 states that Jesus was a fellow counselor with the Father in his work of creation. Thus either the angel that spoke to Hermas contradicted himself, or Jesus was already the Father's counsel in his work of creation in the Father's mind and planning before God literally took his Son as a fellow counselor. If the Son was literally the Father's counselor in God's physical creation, then how is it that the Father took his Son as counsel after the Son's flesh pleased him, the Father? For if the Son was already a living counselor before the Incarnation, then why would God literally take the Son as his counselor again? Hence, it is probable that God considered the Son's foreknown words and deeds in planning his creation as his counsel, just as wisdom is personified in Proverbs chapter 8, before the Son actually became his actual counselor. For God calls the things which be not as though they already were. Romans 4.17 This understanding is hard for us finites to conceive, but it is certainly possible for the infinite God to speak of Christ and his elect as if they already existed before creation. Even Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you and ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. God already knew Jeremiah before he was actually born. In this light, we can understand why inspired scripture states that the Son of God was foreknown before the creation of the world, and why the Son of God is called the firstborn of all creation, and the beginning of the creation of God. For Christ is older than all of God the Father's creatures, because he was first created before God's elect were created, as the beginning of the creation of God, and as wisdom personified in Proverbs 8, 22-30. Trinitarian scholars admit that the Son was not literally made, acquired, or created in Proverbs 8, 22. The Hebrew text from the Tanakh says, The Lord made me as the beginning of his way, the first of the, his works of old. The Septuagint says, The Lord created me. The most literal translation of the Hebrew is, The Lord acquired me. To acquire something implies that God made it. So what did God acquire or make in Proverbs chapter 8? God created the Son as his firstborn before the Son was literally born, just as in Psalm 2-7 it says, You are my Son, this day have I begotten you. In God's prophetic mind, the Son was already firstborn in God's prophetic plan, just as God's elect were born after the firstborn, according to Hermas vision 2-4. The Lord, Yahweh, did not literally make or acquire Jesus as the firstborn of all creation, just like the Lord did not literally make his elect when he foreknew and predestined us in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. Just like a human architect first creates a detailed blueprint before actually building something, 
So our Heavenly Father pre-created all things in and through Christ as his foreknown plan. Since the Son of God spoke with Hermas in the form of the church as the old woman, the Son also represents the woman being the first created, just as in Proverbs 8 and Revelation 3.14 and Colossians 1.15. Since we know that God's elect were not literally created first of all, before the creation of the world, we know that Jesus as a child born and son given was not literally created either. So now let's look at similitude 9.12 with the understanding that the Son was acquired or created as God's wisdom personified in Proverbs chapter 8. The Son of God is older than all his creatures, so that he was a fellow counselor with the Father in his work of creation. Notice the word creatures in the above text. Why would the angel compare God's Son to God's creation by saying the Son of God is older than all his creatures, if the Son was not a part of the creation itself? When we compare Proverbs 8, 22-31 with Revelation 3, 14, we find that Jesus pre-existed as the beginning of the creation of God in the same sense that God's elect were created through God's express plan, his Lagos, before the little creation actually took place. Since God's elect were not literally alive when we were foreknown and predestined, neither was the Son as a Son literally alive when he was foreknown and predestined. Hermas did not believe that Jesus pre-existed as a God the Son, Trinitarianism, or as an angelic Son, Arianism, or just as a created man, Socinianism. According to Hermas Similitude 9.1 and Parable 5, 6, and 7, Jesus pre-existed his birth as the Holy Spirit of God himself before becoming the child born and son given. Since no text in the Shepherd of Hermas ever says that the Holy Spirit was created, Hermas could not have denied Christ's everlasting pre-existence as the Spirit of the mighty God and everlasting Father according to Isaiah 9.6. Therefore, the theology of Hermas was clearly modalistic rather than Arian, Trinitarian, or Socinian. If you have enjoyed this video, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit us on the web at apostolicchristianfaith.com. Lord bless.